Good afternoon, everyone. Um, well, we're here to, uh, to discuss uh, the climate finance in Africa needs challenges and opportunities to deliver low carbon and climate resilient development. My name is Jakob uh, Mulugeta. I'm a, I'm a professor of energy and development policy at University College London in, in the UK. So welcome everyone. Um, well, this uh, uh, event is organized by the Africa Policy Research uh, Institute and the idea really is to, uh, to contribute to this discussion around climate finance uh, and also having done a, a, a very interesting report that sketches some of the interactions of three different countries with the climate uh, finance landscape. We will hear first from uh, Olumude Adimbola, uh, about 10 minutes presentation. And, uh, but let me quickly introduce uh, uh, Olumide, Dr. Olumide Adimbola. By the way, here we're going to be on first name basis. You know, we're going to drop all the titles if you guys all don't mind, yeah? <laughs> so that we you know we are, you know, cuddly and get together, um, yeah. So Olumide is a founder and director of, uh, of APRI. His focus areas include economic informality, trade policy, regional integration, and natural resource management. He has either conducted research or worked in Tunisia, wait, wait to hear this, Tunisia, Cote d'Ivoire, Benin, Togo, and Nigeria. He has also worked with high-level government officials in several other African countries. He previously worked on trade and regional integration at the African Development Bank. So we're looking at someone with huge expertise on trade and of course, Climate issues also interact, you know, with trade quite quite heavily. So, can I invite you, Olumude, to uh, take us through the report? Thank you. So, next to uh, to, uh, to my left is uh, Dr. Lily uh, Odarno, who is director of uh, CATF uh, and and its Energy and Climate Innovation Program Africa. She leads the CATF's uh, effort to address the the dual need of expanding affordable energy in developing countries and building a global decarbonized energy system. Her work focuses on development-centric energy transition pathways, utility markets, and technology innovation for low carbon development in Africa. She has previously led the uh, World Resources Institute Energy Access Initiative in East Africa. She has written widely, extensively on topics at the intersection of energy and development in Africa. She serves on the editorial board of Climate Policy Journal. I didn't know that, so it's good to know for, for those academics. Okay. Um, and also, I mean, I would say Lily holds a PhD from the Center for Energy and Environment Policy, University of Delaware, the CEE uh, P, by the way, was one of the pioneers, early pioneers around energy and environment. So it's a fantastic place to, uh, to, uh, to study. Next to Lily is, um, is uh, Dr. Linda Ogalo. is a climate change adaptation expert who has supported the region in climate proofing extension services and increasing access of climate information to, to the last mile user. Linda coordinates the intergovernmental Authority on Development, IGAD, its climate change technical working group, which, is, which, is, which aims to strategically promote regional exchange of information, dialogue, and climate change in the region. Linda Ogalo holds a PhD in climate change and adaptation from the University of Nairobi. Welcome. And uh, last but not least, Dr. Uh, Olufunso Somorin, is a regional principal officer at the AFDB. leads the bank's work on climate change and green growth in, in the 13 countries of the bank's East African region. This includes supporting countries' access to climate finance for implementing their climate actions and mainstreaming climate change in all bank policies and programs. Um, he holds a PhD in international environmental policy from the Wageningen University in the Netherlands. He gives guest lectures at King's 
uh, College, London, African Leadership University in Rwanda, and Swarthmore University, Kenya. I didn't know about this, so I am going to sign up uh, Funso to some of our lectures. Meron, keep, keep, keep an eye, take a note, yes. So Maureen is an, uh, uh, is, he's also an Eisenhower Fellow. So welcome, everyone. Thank you for being here. So now we have our uh, presentation. Over to you, uh, sir. Thank you very much once again. Uh, now it's going to, can you hear me? Okay. Now it should um, Yeah, I'm going to go into it. I have only 10 minutes. So I'm going to just go right into it without wasting too much time. Um, so in 2009, you know this story, but just bear with me, OK? Because we have to walk our way into it. Um, industrialized countries agreed to provide 100 billion US dollars uh, in climate finance per year by 2020 to developing countries. Um, the amount is supposed to support the countries in mitigating and adapting to the effects of the climate crisis. Um, 100 billion, billion dollars per year uh, figure was sort of arbitrary. Um, and it's also a tiny drop in the ocean of what is actually needed by countries. Um, as a reference point, last year there was a flooding um, in, in, in Europe, parts of Germany, the Netherlands, um, Belgium. Um, the part of Germany that was affected received a commitment of 30 billion US dollars, no, sorry, euros, from the German federal government and the state governments of the area. So 30 billion for that area. So that sort of shows you that the 100 billion is really tiny and it doesn't really amount to much. Um, the amount African governments actually need um, to implement their NDCs from 2020 to 2030 comes to $2.8 trillion or $280 billion per year. Um, again, 100 billion is really nothing. Uh, since 2015, the OECD has been tracking um, how much climate finance is actually provided by the countries that promise to provide the climate finance. Um, as we all know, it's not been fulfilled up till now. Uh, but that is not the point we're trying to make here. The point is that um, the story of climate finance so far is told from the point of view of those who promise to give the money, not from the point of view of those who are supposed to receive the money, right? So we wanted to offer a corrective to this. Uh, we want to you know, um, know more about the other side of the story. So what is the study about? Um, the study was done specifically to understand the story from the other side, like I said. We wanted to understand the global narrative on climate finance from the African perspective. Uh, but beyond understanding what the global narrative means in Africa, we really wanted to have the data uh, on what the policy and institutional setup for climate finance in African countries is. Um, we wanted to understand who the stakeholders are, uh, their roles in the climate finance landscape, and generally speaking, what their story is. Uh, more importantly, though, we wanted to know what the priorities of the governments are of, the, of African countries um, when it comes to climate finance. And we wanted to compare the climate finance flowing into the country to the priorities that the governments have set for themselves in the countries. And last but not the least, uh, we wanted to understand the content of the flows. So private sector versus public sector focus, um, mitigation versus adaptation. Um, and we wanted to be able to come up with recommendations for African governments as well as their partners around climate finance. So to do this, we picked uh, three countries that we felt could be sort of avatars, right? Like not, not exemplary in a sense, but that could give us a sense of what's going on around the continent. So we picked South Africa, uh, we picked Ghana, and we picked Zambia. Then we engaged uh, climate change and climate finance researchers in the three countries to have a close look at, the, um, at, the, at each country. I'm glad that the person who worked with us on this Zambia case, Mulima, is in the room. So if there's anything that I say that you don't like, just turn to her. <laughs> That's Mulima. <laughs> So what was the research? Um, the research includes first consulting all the publicly available information on climate change and climate finance in the three countries. And after that, uh, the researchers did a stakeholder mapping of every single uh, agency 
uh, in the countries responsible for anything to do with climate finance, um, from government agencies to private sector agencies, including banks uh, in the countries doing anything on climate finance. Um, and then they engage with them, both individually but also in a stakeholder event uh, in the countries. Um, it also, the work also included reconciling quantitative data that is available um, and seeing basically what is reported versus what is actually received. So I will um, now proceed to talking about the main findings. Um, first of all, what I'm doing here is going to be very high level. I have 10 minutes. And second of all, I'm going to be uh, also uh, fairly shallow. Okay, so the report is already available on our website, so you will see it there. So don't, if I don't tell you specific things, it's because I don't have time. Um, we found out that climate financing inflows into the region has been, of course, far short of what is needed. That is nothing new, except that we now have, we have numbers for it. Um, conservative estimates indicate that Africa needs $2.5 trillion or $250 billion annually in both conditional and unconditional uh, financing from 2020 to 2030 uh, to implement their NDCs. Um, current reported annual climate finance inflows amount to only $30 billion. So that's equivalent to only 12% of conservative uh, estimates. Uh, this is, of course, woefully inadequate uh, to address the challenges that the countries are facing. Um, our researchers also found out that public finances, um, mostly from M MDBs, comprise 86% of the flows, while private sector financing, mostly corporate, contributed 14%. Um, they also found out that across board, since the pandemic and the war in Ukraine, uh, it has become even more challenging for African governments to mobilize external financing, given penalization in the market and weaker credit ratings, even if this don't represent the projects that are actually being sought, uh, that, that people are actually looking for financing for. So you know the general credit rating agency stories and Africa and, you know, et cetera. Um, so the ADOS funding approval process of, you know, the funding that are, that's available, we don't have to mention them. Um, we found, uh, they also found that um, this was a big issue around climate financing in African countries, so access. Right. Um, digging deeper into the countries, um, we found that the financing going to South Africa is predominantly focused on mitigation, and private finance plays a much bigger role in South Africa than in, two, in the two other countries we looked at. Uh, this, of course, comes with certain issues attached to private uh, sector financing. Uh, in Zambia, we found that the country has started preparing a green growth strategy, as well as formulating sector-specific national adaptation plans, which will provide clarity on the actions the government wants to undertake, as well as how external actors can support them. In Ghana, we found that the government has outlined several key policies as target areas. Um, and they've built action plans and financing strategies for climate action, of which deepening renewable energy uh, penetration is paramount. Across all the countries, the need for more grant financing and concessional loan came across very strongly. So we have recommendations for African governments, but here I'm going to focus on the ones for external actors. Um, one, we say that there is a need for clear accounting rules and common reporting um, standards to account for climate change uh, finance. Um, and internationally agreed accounting rules that would allow for more transparency on the disclosure of climate financing at the global level, including to African countries, that's much needed. Uh, for instance, the UNFCCC's working definition of climate finance does not provide clear rules on what can be counted as local, national, or transnational financing, or public, private, and alternative sources of financing. This needs to be fixed. Uh, two, there's a need to connect climate finance to other development objectives that the countries and regions have uh, created, starting from the NDCs, but also to national development plans. And that's something that we, we don't see enough of. Uh, we, we recommend that this be done. Um, we also think that there needs to be more consensual public and private finan financing where it's available, um, because more financing uh, where, you know, where possible, there needs to be more public-private partnerships. 
but we need to be very clear that there's a lot that cannot be done by private financing, especially around, around adaptation. And so public financing has to pick up a lot of this. Um, we also um, say that there's need for technical assistance. Um, that's what we say when we don't know what else to say, but there really is need for technical assistance in specific issues around here. Um, because uh, from the stakeholder engagements that the, the research teams had, one point that kept coming up with that was that people don't know about the funding opportunities that exist. Uh, people also don't know how to access them, even when they know that they exist. Uh, this is important because almost every month there's a new thing announced by someone that's doing climate financing, and that it's really important that people actually know they exist and know the rules of how to access them. That's a big issue that was pointed out. Um, and finally, I, I kind of there. Um, rich countries definitely need to pay up on the commitments they've made. This is the implementation COP. Um, it's the time to actually get beyond promises and get to action. Um, that also came out in the, in the stakeholder engagements we had. Um, so as I mentioned earlier, the, um, we have published the report. It's on our website now, and you can download it um, if you go to the website right now. Thank you. Thank you so much, uh, Olumide. You will not join us, but you will uh, stay there to respond to some questions if they emerge. Yeah? And also Mulima over there, yes. Um, I mean, I think one thing which, uh, I mean, yesterday we had um, a meeting, a discussion around energy uh, uh, pathways in Africa. Um, others are talking about agriculture. And, and, and the whole the question of uh, um, financing is something that we don't seem to uh, to get away from. So, in a sense, you know, every conversation that we are having becomes a conversation about finance, and it's the same here. Of course, you know, we are talking about finance, but quite clearly, you've also outlined, you know, how finance and development need to uh, to speak to each other, and um, you know, more concessional finance is going to be needed in order for you know to draw in the the the, the uh, for the public sector to have a a deeper involvement. So, so in so many ways, there seems to be politics, you know, written all over it as well. I mean, I'm not talking about big politics, but certainly there is something happening there. So, climate finance, its dominance is is something that we know. So, my question really is: uh, Let me start off with you, Linda. Why has there been, you know, so much of this political contestation in, uh, you know, associated with the with the whole climate finance discussion that we are having? Thank you for being here. Uh, thank you for having me. Um, I think sometimes when we think about climate finance, so when we talk about climate finance generally, we don't really consider the root of where the money is coming from. So if uh, we are talking about uh, the West needs to pay up, so you're talking about the Western people need to pay up, so you're talking about taxpayers' money for the regular person, and you need to convince them that the government needs to take their money or money they could use to the, for their people to then give to the African people. That's a very hard conversation to have, even for us if we're on the other side of the table. So sometimes I think we don't always consider that it's, it's easy to talk about it as 100 billion, but where is this 100 billion coming from? And the governments that, are, that we are asking to give us this 100 billion, they have to take it from somewhere else. And the people who that they're taking it from are the same people who have to elect them back and put them back into office. So it's not always a simple conversation sometimes as we wish to have it. And sometimes the reason why we don't get to a resolution is like most of the conversations that we're having globally is we're very polarized in terms of where we are from one side or the other. And we don't look at things from the landscape from where we are. Like the whole world is right now facing an economic um, crisis. So who's going to accept for money to be given even for anything else and for africa when we are talking about it's almost like saying my house is burning our house is burning but we're saying um let me go to my neighbor to try and see if they can pay for what they're doing in the middle of the house burning so sometimes for african nations i feel like we need to sit back and put the fire out figure out how can we put the fire out before we start um, talking about who needs to pay for the damage of what the fire has done. But we're in the middle of the fire and we need to figure out as African nations, what do we need to do as African nations? 
before we put the responsibility on the West in terms of what they have done and what they have caused. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you, uh, Linda. So, so in a sense, you know, you let's take some responsibility while engaging with the whole... Yeah. Not, not responsibility, because it's not our fault. Right, okay. it's, if, you're, if you're in trouble, <laughs> you, you fix you. yourself first before you, you file a lawsuit, you know? You buy a car, you go to the hospital, you make sure you're well, you make sure your house is in order, and then you go after the people who came after you. But as long as our house is still burning, I think we need to begin to think, because realistically, if we wait on the outside to come and fix the issues, evidence has shown that we've been waiting for a long time and they haven't come until now. Yeah. I don't know where we think it's going to be any different. Thank you. Thank you. And sorry for misrepresenting it. Yes, responsibility is the wrong term to, uh, to use. Absolutely. Um, Funso, let me, let me now turn to you. I mean, this really is about uh, barriers. I think what, what Linda is outlining is the question about the urgency of it and the, and, and the need for you to put out the fire in your house uh, and not wait you know, for, uh, for help. Of course, you know, while the fireman is on the way, um, you, know, you, you don't just wait. You do the best you can. Uh, within that. So the question really here is uh, slightly more um, perhaps, you know, medium term, if you will, on the question of barriers to, to climate finance. Um, when we talk about barriers, we often talk about, you know, the, 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 the lack of bankable projects, uh, weak institutional capacity, and so forth, to climate investment. But we've been talking about this for a long, long time, while the fire is burning that, that Linda is talking about, yeah? So why have these barriers persisted? A guy you know, who works in the bank, you understand money, how it works, how it circulates, and so forth. Why has it persisted so long, for so long, when it is so obvious that the benefits, well, the benefits are pretty obvious? Great, thank you. Um, first, let me thank the organizers. Great honor to be here. Um, I have a feeling we, we are allowed to be very honest here, right? Absolutely. Good point. Um, so I, I want, First, it's important to appreciate the fact that we are having COP27 right now. That tells you that for the last 26 COPs, we, we're kind of pushing our buying time. So this house is burning, and the fireman has taken 26 years, or 26 COPs, and he's still not here. And chances are that he's still going to need more COPs together. So in the interim, it's very important that we quickly look within to see what can we do in the shortest time mm -hmm. to buy time, hopefully. But it is very imperative to emphasize that the fireman must come. Okay? He has to come at some point. So, and that is where the predictability and the additionality of that climate finance becomes very imperative. Um, look, the climate finance conversation is a very difficult one um, on many, multiple levels. And thank you, Lou, for your presentation. It's important to emphasize the fact that why there's a mismatch between the demand side and the supply um, in terms of the quantum of resources that we need. People who are literally involved will tell you there is actually a pattern of growth. Year to year, we are seeing increase in climate finance. But that increase is moving at a pace that is slower compared to the need. As we delay in that sp pace, the need becomes bigger. So when we, in 2019, when we said $100 billion per year, whatever you could buy for $100 in 2019, 2009, you can't buy exactly. that same exactly. item for exactly. $100 in, in 2022. So the longer we stay, the more expensive it becomes, the more the quantum of resources that we need. And that is the part of that demand and supply. Because there's a time dimension in where you don't act quickly, it's going to become more expensive and it, it may become more catastrophic. The second part of it is, unfortunately, the flow to Africa is very skewed towards mitigation. Now, when you look at analysis, we look at the 54 NDCs that are be produced by African countries. All of them have prioritized adaptation to be their greatest need, to be what it's urgent. Here is the, the dilemma. The priority adaptation, but money is going to mitigation. Now, if we consider money to flow in the direction of value, 
if I paid for a bottle of water, it's because I placed value over water as opposed to value over cigarettes. Now, if money is going the direction of value, this is where the, the, the dilemma comes in because adaptation is the value, adaptation is the priority, but unfortunately, money is going to mitigation. And even in the poorest countries, even in the poorest country. So that tells us again that this current structure is not fit for purpose. We need to relook into redesigning the old climate finance architecture completely. The third part, and I think now we're speaking to Africans, it will interest you to also know that of these billions of dollars that have reached African countries, disbursement rate is barely 20%. So we're complaining that we don't have enough money. Even the money that we got, we're struggling to implement projects at scale and at speed. And so that speaks to the institutional and the challenges that we're talking about. When you see, say, barriers, those, who were, those in the West are also aware of the fact that your, your utilization rate is very low within the continent. There that are... That are um, qual uh, capacities that you need to put in place quickly and, and that entry point is very important. The barriers will always be there. I, I'm not going to even tell you what are the solutions to it. They have always been there. But we need that level of combination of capacity together with good leadership, match that together to drive beyond the barrier. So, and I think it's very, particularly when it comes to adaptation, which is very much the, the need of most African countries. And, and, and I want to say that on the one hand, we have elevated our attention on public resources over private capital. Unfortunately, when you look at the global climate flows, the bulk of the money is private capital. So where the money is, we are not activating that and that's something that is very important and we have to find what are those barriers structural barriers against private capital flows in africa the second barrier that we need to address is the old sense of this mismatch in the market have you ever heard people who say people who have money sell you they can't find projects and people who have projects will tell you they can't find money in the same environment and we keep hearing that all the time from global level, even to individual entrepreneurship project to project level. So it's very important to what is the bridge that is needed to facilitate that interaction and that continuous interaction between that supply and the demand. And, and, and those are some of those barriers that we need to break. The last part of it is, look, um, there will always be the need for the skin in the game. People think the African countries are already spending their money. Already. When you think about the cost that most countries are responding, spending right now, to respond to the, some of the challenges they're dealing with, the Horn of Africa crisis, the flood in Nigeria, they're already spending money. So it's very important within the whole climate finance narrative to also help us to channel the resources locally, domestically, into right pro, pro, proactive actions as opposed to being reactive. Billions of dollars, and you know this, anything between five so 15% of Africa's $1.3 trillion GDP is spent in responding to climate change, or the cost of that. What if we can turn that around, and instead of spending that on disaster risk management, we're able to anticipate investment on the long term, and I think that's very important. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you, uh, Funso. I mean, one, one thing, just to, to highlight one item that you just uh, um, talked about. I mean, there was a, there's a report that came out uh, just a few months ago from the African Development Bank. This is the, uh, the African Economic Outlook. And, and for this year, they, the AFDB chose to uh, on climate. And this is just you know, some data or some analysis that was done by, by your colleagues. And you, yeah. you were involved in that as well. Absolutely. So based on this report's work, for example, carbon debt. We're talking about carbon debt here. Uh, the total climate finance due to Africa to compensate for historical and future emissions is estimated at between 4.76 and 4.84 trillion US dollars through 2050, which translates into an annual figure of between 163, 163 billion and 173 billion by between 2020 and 2050. This is more or less you know, what, uh, what Punso is talking about. 
essentially highlighting the fact that Africa is actually African, the, you know, poor farmers and, and others, you know, who are dealing with the, with the ravages of uh, climate change are having to pay uh, for, um, for their own needs. So in a sense, you know, there is a, a, a certain level of carbon, a certain level of credit there that's owed to Africa. And here I'm just talking about, you know, carbon credit. Then, you know, when you start loss and damage, you know, then the figure can add up even more. So let's uh, come back to our um, uh, conversation here. Um, but this was just, you know, to provide some context. So, so in a sense, you know, what, what's happening there is that, you know, there is a certain problem, some challenges with the architecture that we're playing with. Yeah. Um, or or if, whether it's the a problem with the framework or the paradigms that are, you know, within the architecture, uh, it's something, you know, that, that we need to sort of uh, to, to talk about. My question is, um, what is precisely wrong with the architecture, um, Lily? And what are the kinds of reforms that we can anticipate or do? I mean, I guess, you know, we're talking in, in some ways, we're talking about essentially our wish list, essentially. You know, what can we do to try and fix this architecture? Thank you, Jacob, and thanks everyone for being here. And uh, thanks to my co-panelists uh, for your very insightful comments as well. And Jacob, I think this is a great question. Uh, I, I was in a panel earlier this week, and there was a representative uh, from the United States, uh, from northern United States, bordering Canada. And he made an, a statement which I thought was very, very striking to me. He said that, you know, we cannot expect the paradigm that created the problem to fix the problem that it has created. And I think that is what we confront uh, in, in the climate challenge. So I want to talk about a few things. The first thing I want to talk about is the framing of the problem that's, that's we have, uh, that, that, that we are facing or that we're living today. When we talk about climate change in the international discourse, what do we hear? We hear emissions. We hear 1.5 degrees C. We hear 2050, 2100 are so disconnected from what people are feeling every day. And so I think it, it creates an alienation from the complexity of what the problem really is, that it's not only an emissions problem, that it's, a it's an adaptation problem, it's an economic development problem, it's an infrastructural development problem. So the framing itself is extremely pro problematic. And I think that is a starting point. Uh, so we only remember emissions, and we feel that is only where we can make the most impact. Nobody remembers the farmer in the Horn of Africa who can't harvest anything because of a drought, because it, uh, it's not in 1.5 C. Emissions, 2050, that's not the first image that comes to mind. So we really need a fundamental reframing of the problem. And secondly, I would say that there's still a big profit, um, a profit motive that is still infused in climate action, whether or not we agree that is so. And when we look at how decisions around funding for climate finance, it's clear that there's still a very strong profit motive. So, the, so climate finance is not only unfairly split between adaptation and mitigation, but most of it is also being dispersed as loans and not grants. And not as cheap loans, expensive loans. We have some developed countries who are able to access climate finance at, at interest rates of up to 18%. That's extremely high interest rates. And so there's still this profit motive that is informing and shaping how we are implementing our climate finance, uh, finance um, efforts, which is problematic. So in the end, who is able to access climate finance easily? Middle-income countries, and then you have sub-Saharan African countries, small island uh, countries, not able to access much of climate finance. Because the, the framing is wrong, the motive is still a profit motive, even though we do not really want to acknowledge that that's, that is what the motive is. And then I think a third problem with the framework is that, how do we even hold anybody accountable? 
countries say they've given this amount of money to climate finance. We don't, and I think the report actually highlights that in a really beautiful way. What is the framework for tracking whether this is public, whether it's private, whether it's, it's, it's whether the U.S. really did give this amount of money? What were the projects, and does it really add up to what's being reported? Nobody knows, and so there are really issues with the framing, with the motive, uh, with accountability, which we need to confront if we are going to shift anything around. And uh, so, to your uh, to your question, Jakob, in terms of solutions, I think that. First of all, we must realize that climate change is a really systems issue. And we say this all the time, but I don't know how much it's actually hit home. That unless we appreciate it that way, our financing is not going to match up because we are still going to think emissions. We are going to remember the numbers and forget the people. We are going to forget about adaptation. We are going to forget about the infrastructural needs that we have and which must be addressed in, in aligning that. So I hope uh, if we could do anything in terms of the wish list, that we could, we could enable a fundamental reframing of what the problem is, that we could actually change our motives in a very honest way, and that we'll be able to build in these systems of accountability and tracking in terms of where the finance goes. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you, Linda. So um, was there anything I, I could see? Linda, you wanted to, to come in. Well, let's give you a... I, I, I could see that. I could feel it. <laughs> no, I was basically agreeing with her because she touched on some very, very cool issues in terms of um, the framing of the conversation. Right. And I think also that's part of the problem is that we're having different conversations. If, when we talk about climate change from the African perspective, we're talking about a now problem. When we talk ab And we're talking about how to live with it. And when we talk about climate change from the Western perspective or the Mitter's perspective, it's a future problem. And rightfully, in a lot of ways, I think we also don't give each other a lot of grace in the conversation, because if I'm an emitter and you're telling me that this is my problem, that the problem is climate change because of what I'm doing, and then I want to put all the resources to stop doing it, then in, in a lot of ways they're not wrong in doing that and focusing on that and the, the cost of decarbonizing um, the entire Western world is completely expensive. So they're pretty much right in saying that. And we are also right in saying that the cost that of the problem that they have caused right now is huge. We, people are dying. We have countries like Somalia right now at the brink of famine. So it's co the cost is lives. It's dire for us. But where can we begin to start having the same conversation? So if the framing issue is a huge issue. And also, I think we also don't, from the African perspective, don't look at it more holistically. I like that she talked about infrastructure and economic development, but the problem with vulnerable populations is also poverty. He talked about capacity as well. Uh, the reason why someone is not able to, to adapt when there's little to less water is largely because they don't have the money to do it. And a lot of that has to do with lack of access to social, basic social services. So many times when we talk about climate information, we're not having the conversation about the lack of social services, the lack of education, the lack of opportunities for the most vulnerable communities who are dying. They don't have any other options. So some of those conversations and some of the financing that is going towards that is not even being considered adaptation finance. But it is, because when you empower and you give um, the rural communities education, access to finance, you build their capacity to adapt, and that is part of adaptation finance. Thank you. Thank you so much, Linda. Um, I just wonder if, um, you know, just, just to give our, our friends here a little bit of a, a rest, if, as it were. Was there any questions, you know, from your end? You know, just, uh, we'll take, you know, one or two questions. Um, if you have any, otherwise, you know, we can continue and then, you know, we'll come back to your questions later. Okay. Lily, I'm uh, going to come back to you. <laughs> and then I'll come uh, to you, Fonso, in a moment. It's a tough question, so get ready with it. Um, Lily, developed countries are often asked to honor past pledges. I think we've touched on, on it, you know, just a moment ago by providing adequate finance, 
to support African climate action. During the high-level consultations, for example, at uh, COP26, developing countries criticized developed countries for failing to, pl you know, to pledge to commit the 100 billion um, uh, US annually, basically to support climate action. Now, what we've been talking about is this, this figure is, is a drop in the ocean, as it were. You know, it's very, very small. Not, uh, you know, it doesn't even address the mitigation challenge, leave alone the, uh, the adaptation. Um, so has, has this 100 billion story, has it become a, almost like a mental stumbling block, you know, from becoming more ambitious and, and, and really entering into this kind of, um, um, you know, call it, you know, this persistence of low expectations, if you will. Yeah, uh, that's, that's a great question. And I, I, I think so. I think that the, the 100 billion framing is being, is become a stumbling block for, for a number of reasons. And the first one I'll highlight is that the $100 billion is not the only, uh, that is an unfulfilled pledge. But there are other problems in the finance landscape generally. Development finance is, is also scaling back. And I think there isn't much talk about it, but it's extremely important that we be aware that the scaling back of development finance is critically important even to achieving climate goals. So the United Kingdom announced cuts to foreign aid. Uh, Norway announced cuts to foreign aid. I believe Sweden is on, kind of on the same path. And these are, I think, three of the five countries who usually exceed uh, the 0.7% GDP that developing, developed countries uh, have pledged uh, to give developing countries. Three of them are scaling back finance. Um, and what that means is that we may probably be seeing a deepening of poverty, as you mentioned. We may be seeing a deepening of the cri uh, crisis with the provision of basic services. We are going to see a scale back of several development services. We are not having this conversation uh, in this space. Even as we are here, we are talking about the 100 million pledge, forgetting that there's also something which is really being scaled back which is impacting development seriously that nobody is talking about. And it goes back to what I said initially, that unless we remember to always frame climate as a systems issue, we are going to be attacking the issue in a very piecemeal way. And so in that sense, I, I see that the 100, uh, the, 100 billion, the 100 billion framing is very, very counterproductive. And personally, I also think that <laughs> the developed countries are really not going to pay it anyway. <laughs> so um, I, I agree with the point that uh, Linda made in the beginning that, look, they really are not going to pay this anyway. Um, and so it's, it doesn't make it right. I think I, I, am, I am perhaps not as diplomatic as Linda in talking about whether or not uh, developed countries should feel responsible. I think they should. I think that the reality that um, climate emissions uh, have, have, have been, that the climate challenge has been born on the back of poor countries is something that um, shouldn't be watered down in any way. I think it's true, but I've also said that there's a distinction between our expectation of what the world should be and what it really is. When it comes to the climate problem, unfortunately, the expectation of what the world should be is not what we are seeing. We are living what the world is. And what the world is is that the world is very unequal. Uh, we live in a political economic system that allows people to be able to exert political, geopolitical influence on others in an unfair way. That's the reality of the world within which we live. And that is the context with which, within which we navigate climate solutions. So I am less, I am less, um, I am, I am perhaps less kinder on, on expressing that. Um, but I think the other thing is that um, it, the 100 billion uh, focus also tends to, we underappreciate the local solutions that are already in play. So um, farmers living in areas which are hit by drought 
are, are fixing things, they are finding solutions, even when governments are not supporting them. I think that the application of local knowledge in expanding some of those solutions should be valued and should be accounted for in climate action because then it paints a picture of people sitting down doing nothing and waiting for something to fall from. That's not a true picture. People are trying to find local solutions to climate action, to climate change in local spaces, and we need to highlight those stories. And then I think that leads to your point that, you know, governments also have an opportunity to leverage domestic financing in ways that maybe we are not doing. What could we do with the private sector per se? Could we build better enabling environments? Could we think about institutional shifts that could help to catalyze that? Focusing on that 100 billion and the fact that it's not been done and that it's not fair, it's all right and it's true, but I think it shouldn't cloud both the progress that we have made in our local spaces and the capacity that exists for us to be able to make expansions in those areas as well. That would be my response. Thank you. Thank you, Linda. Thank you. Um, Fonso, it looks like uh, we have to rely on something else outside of grants. Governments are, are even cutting down on, uh, on aid. Uh, they, have not you know, they have not fulfilled their pledges of the past. We know that, even you know, the Africa Renewable Energy, pro all you know, we can name so many different programs as well. So we're left to try and operate the market, as it were. So in terms of you know, innovative financing tools, what's, what's out there that's really worth concentrating on in your, in your personal view? Thank you, um, and this is a very, um, very relevant question. And, and just to go into that, uh, allow me to put two contests out there quickly. Number one, and I think we should all agree in this room, that whatever we call finance does not exist in an institutional vacuum. You know, there's no such thing as money hanging in there. M finance is nested within an overarching um, political interaction, engagement models, uh, partnership arrangement in a country. So whether, within, whether between countries or whether with, between public and private, those structures determine the flow of finance. It's very important because we're looking at finance in terms of numbers, but we're forgetting that there are triggers, there are political um, ecosystems behind uh, making that finance to flow. The second thing is also to understand this. Money is not necessarily scarce. Money is just unevenly distributed. And I think it's very critical to say that because what we have is there's an abundance of capital in one part of the world and perhaps less needed there. And there's a, you know, a bit of a limited capital in another part of the world where it's most needed. And what we need to think, where our innovation needs to come in, is how do we move money from where it is most abundant perhaps less needed, to where it is most needed and less abundant. I don't know if that makes sense to you. And that is what we need to do. So whatever form of innovation is to move money. We don't need to print more money. We don't need to wait to do trade and make profit before we solve the problem. The quantum of money we have in the global financial system can solve all the different challenges across the world. We just need to move it from where it is most abundant to where it is most needed. And how do we do that? That's where the innovation comes in, in trying to, um, the simplest answer would be, you know, they would call it something called blended finance. And I don't like to say it because it looks as if it's such an easy thing, but it's not. But what I think is very important in the African context is we need to turn a lot of our dormant capital pool resource pools into productive assets. Look, do you know the billions of dollars that African countries have in pension fund, or even in, in money sitting in financial assets? Um, I, I was speaking somewhere yesterday and I said, look, the, there's this famous M-Pesa in Kenya, um, I mean, not M-Pesa, SACO, you know, the traditional banking system and this is sitting on a financial asset pool of over $40 billion. Think about how to convert that. So the instrument, the innovation in the instrument is also must speak to the innovation around how we customize solutions. 
um, and then obviously within the context of the market conditions of that country. So today, we're pushing for new innovations such that um, for adaptation, for instance, to instrument, concessional loan and grants, 99% um, of all adaptation finance are basically around two instruments. Whereas for mitigation, 11 different instruments, you know, um, you know, under guarantee, there's partial risk guarantees, there's partial credit guarantee, we, we've got equities, we've got mezzanine debt and all of that. It's very important to begin to test these different financial instruments for different projects within the market conditions of those countries. I'm going to say this again, because the moment you tell people that we need money, with, we, you can easily accept the, the, the notion that the money is not there. Money is there, it yeah. just needs to be distributed. And this is distribution challenge that we're trying to solve. And so we at the African Development Bank, so to close, we tend to uh, put a lot of capital on the table, and, but also take the risks that most other government and private sector won't be able to take in providing those guarantees and risk sharing mechanisms in order to crowd in private capital. The, the point is very also clear. The money is within the private capital space, then we have to be innovative. One thing that I think we need to learn to do in Africa, and, and Ulu, you may not like this, we need to learn the language of money. We really need to learn the language of money. Not everything will come to you by grant. I mean, the scale of the financing that we need is actually not going to come by grant. So we also need to be able to build those viable projects um, commercially viable, financially viable, economically viable, and be able to attract the kind of instrument. Thank you. Thank you. Um, I'm not going to call on you, otherwise you guys are going to fight there. She doesn't agree with and me. I'm Don't glad let I'm on talk. this, you know, over here Please. as well. Um, oh, <laughs> are there any questions that... Uh, I'll, come, I'll come to you, uh, Linda, in a moment. Uh, but if there are any questions before we wind down, Seems like you know people are uh, sleepy. Yeah, or relative, let's say. Yeah, that's more like it. Okay, we'll. Uh, ah. Shout. Thanks, Jacob. Um, thank you for, for the panel um, and, and for the interventions. Uh, really good. And I, I agree that there is a lot of finance there. Um, I was just wondering if you can share some thoughts on bankability, like how, how can we then make these, these programs bankable in a way that you can actually get the, the finance? And maybe we can also think about kind of this, this new, uh, Lily I think said it very well, this, this, this paradigm shift and, and, and we see this, you know, there's of course always, you know, money to be made. But investment in Africa, actually, if you talk about sustainable investments, there's a lot of social capital that you can build. There's a lot of environmental capital you can build. And there's a lot of companies. If you look at Unilever, for instance, it's a big multinational company. They want to have impact on social and environmental dimensions as much as they do on economic uh, dimensions. So bankability, I think this concept kind of can be broadened uh, to the direction that potentially serves Africa, actually. So I just wanted to see if you had some thoughts on, on, on that, how, uh, you know, what, what kind of conditions would have to exist in these projects uh, for, for the, for, to, to bridge this gap. I was hoping you were not going to go there. Um, so this thing called bankability is a very tricky thing because what it means for the person with the money, the supply, may dif be different from the person with the demand. So for a project developer, the asset of concept, I've tested it, it can work. It is bankable. However, for an investor, bankability is, have you tested it in the market? Do you have returns? Have, have people started talking about it? And this, uh, and we need to harmonize that language, and I agree with you. So what we do at the African Development Bank, on a larger scale, away from individual entrepreneur, on a larger scale, is to understand the and break down the whole project into, you know, into phases. And you, don't you may not necessarily need private capital at the beginning. So part of equity capital and probably some uh, concessional terms or even grant resources, you're able to take the project from concept idea up to feasibility or even market testing and it's already in operation. Private capital may then come in for scaling. 
So it, it, it's a language thing, but you harmonize it along the entire value chain of a project. But people who probably have been told that are expecting the capital when you're still at the point of you know, testing and all of that. And at the larger level, at national level, it's very important to encourage aggregation. Um, you see, when you have a portfolio of projects and you look at them, to, there's a possibility that you internalize and share risk as opposed to the exposure of individual projects. So we increasingly encourage people to look at aggregation uh, together. Thank you. Thank you. You guys can take it outside because I think you know, there's more discussion uh, in that. Um, last question uh, because we have to, we have to stop. Uh, do we have time for one final one? Yeah? Please. Well, just to follow up to the last point made. We all know what the problems are. We also have an idea of what the solutions are. I mean, if we take the energy transition, for example, we know what the impacts will be in rural areas in Africa. Why can't we relax some of these conditionalities so that we move? These are problems that are facing us, and we all know the realities. Why can't we relax some of these conditionalities? That's my point. We can take that bilateral, right? Who would? <laughs> Lily? I, I, I agree with you 100%. And, you know, if you take the Green Climate Fund, for instance, um, we talk about it as an example of an instrument which has been placed out. People cannot access the Green Climate Fund. And we know these issues. Um, even just the application process, the complexity of the application process, just eliminates most of most of the whether it's it's whether it's entrepreneur whatever whether whatever institutions in the developed developing countries uh, resources cannot access them, and I absolutely agree with you that if we appreciate um, this is an issue that we are facing with we are being faced with in the now and need to address immediately. I think we need to, we need to we need to lessen some of these rules a little bit. I also wanted to make a point uh, relating to bankability you know, uh, in, the, in the context of even impact investing. And going to your point, Philip, about uh, whether we should expand what the, what the meaning of bankability means. I think that's absolutely right. Even in impact investing, in Kenya, uh, we, there was a study recently which was looking at um, whether entrepreneurs in Kenya who are looking to expand uh, into the solar markets could access impact investments. And we found that 75% of those funds were going to companies which were based in Europe and the US. They are, not, they are not Kenyan companies. And the Kenyan companies are not able to access the, these investments even though they are labeled as impact investments. So I think there are some real issues there about, um, and I talk about the profit narrative in that context that I know that especially for those in the private sector, but I think that as, uh, as the gentleman said, that if we appreciate the enormity of the challenge and the fact that people are literally dying from the impacts of climate change, why can't we change the narrative? And I feel that's where we probably should be pushing the conversation as we move forward. And having some of those conversations at COP as well, um, and moving from the more mainstream, are we going to be asking for 100 million into some of these real issues as to how we finance for real people, for real solutions? Thank you, thank you, Lily. Linda, over to you now. Um, and, and basically, okay, we've, we've had all these discussions here there's so much going on. What are we to expect out of uh, COP27? What would you like to see? Um, now, again, I'm asking <laughs> dream. I think I don't really have a lot of faith in the COP process, so to speak, in terms of having actionable outcomes that right. can actually be um, realized because there's a lot of hope in the, in the Paris Agreement. When the Paris Agreement uh, was, was had, we had so much faith and so much hope that things would change, but nothing did change. So what I do expect out of 
uh, out of COP is an exchange of ideas with uh, very well-meaning people, with exchange, building of uh, networks, building of capacity, finding new conversations, new common ground. But in terms of expecting anything from, I think it's a good place to build a system such that when the people are ready, the frameworks are in place. But I think as we've already discussed, there's a lot wrong with the existing frameworks. So expecting something good to come from something that's broken is, is setting yourself up for disappointment, so to speak. Thank you. Thank you, Linda. Thank you. Um, I'm afraid we... Uh, you want to say something? No. No. <laughs> Not after that, eh? Just, look, I, I also I th think... I thought you said look, no. The COP <laughs> events are good. The negotiations are useful with the old notion of a collective action. But I actually strongly believe that solutions will require uh, maybe different forms or additional steps outside. Have you noticed now we're beginning to see where countries are coming? Uh, um, you know, South Africa had it last year. Um, we're beginning to see countries having their own roadmap, uh, investment programs, and that. And I'm beginning to see that we're going to be having a lot of that going forward. Yeah. So within the notion of collective thinking, collective actions, there is a sense of, look, I can't wait. What can we do? And that is why that notion of partnership is going to be the order of the day. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you so much. Um, I'm not even going to, to try and, and, and summarize. There's a lot that we have, uh, we have discussed here. Uh, and also we are running uh, quite late. But uh, let, me, let me thank uh, our uh, uh, distinguished guests here. Lily, Linda, Funso, Olumude. Thank you so much for, uh, for this wonderful event. I hope you can we can continue this discussion because I do think you know, that uh, it is beginning to, um, to be opened up, you know, at least uh, uh, the debate, you know, when, when you have civil society and the African Development Bank sitting on the same table and discussing, that's, uh, that's progress. Thank you. <laughs>